Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webcast of Philips Healthcare. The ventilation paradigm finally resolved. At our customer's request, this conference will be recorded. During the presentation, you have the opportunity to ask questions via the text box in your webcast window. Your questions will then be answered at the end of the conference. May I now hand you over to Professor Belder, who will lead you through this conference. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. I think uh, for me it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, an opportunity to address uh, a lot of people from my own uh, office. So it's, uh, it's nice to be here to have this talk, this comfortable talk for you. So and then my, the topic is the, ventila the ventilation paradigm finally resolved, final result. I would like to first of all to show my conflicts of interest. I am being cooperating with several companies that you can see here in the slide. And after this, I would like just to define a little better what is a paradigm. This, this paradigm is, uh, was uh, the definition by Thomas Kuhn in, uh, in the last, uh, in the past uh, century in the structure of science revolution. And uh, it's a problem. It's a, the paradigm is a, pro in a, in a certain time is a problem having mm, in this moment the solutions for the community of practitioners. So we, in, in terms of ventilation, the problem was the respiratory failure and the solution was the mechanical ventilation and the ventilators. So this has been a, you know, different, uh, have been evolved during the time, starting, if you like, in the 1920, when Drinker and Shaw proposed the first iron lung for treat the respiratory paralysis of the respiratory insufficiency related to muscle paralysis. So this is a, a new improvement of this iron lung for four children. Look in the Boston Children's Hospital. And this in, the, in 1931 was improved this model uh, by Emerson and uh, for single patients, and you can see here, you know, like an intensive care unit ward with a lot of iron lungs for treat the muscle paralysis of these patients. You can see every one of the machines was with a patient that were taken care, you know, for the, the res respiratory failure. So, but this was evolved because in the 1952, there was a polio outbreak in Denmark with respiratory paralysis as well, and Bjorn Nipsen proposed positive pressure ventilation through tracheostomy. So the tracheostomy was a, a really important issue in, this, in the treatment of these patients. So we used, the, they use, I'm sorry, they use these positive pressure machines, old machines, but also the old but new Engstrom ventilator that you can see in this slide. So patients were, tre were treated by tracheostomy. So and and and, and you can see here this this uh, uh, this reference of uh, bent careful diagnosis and adequate indications for tracheostomy and artificial respiration determine immediate prognosis in severe case of poliomyelitis. So they were treated with tracheostomy and artificial respiration, and they improved the prognostic a lot. You know, the mortality, the mortality was before 90% and was down to 25% of these patients. So tracheostomy was a very important thing. And in fact, you can see here in this paper, uh, from 1955, you know, in the section of laryngology that discussing the modern indication for tracheostomy, looking that the, with a special reference and to the management of those cases requiring artificial respiration. So it was really important to see that the, when you have a respiratory failure, you know, in this moment, the solution was 
through mechanical ventilation for the first time, positive pressure ventilation using tracheostomy and, uh, for, the, for the treatment. Not, uh, not a lot of time later, you know, the diagnosis improved, and uh, in, 19, in 1972, you, 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 you saw, you know, that was published the acute respiratory failure in the adult and the, and the, uh, in the British Journal, uh, in, I'm sorry, in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, and publishing this book, you know, gathering two, two or three papers from those days, and this was a book uh, in 1972, and this book was a, was a nice book because it was a compilation of all all the all the uh, the material that they uh, gathered on uh, for this. Uh, for uh, le uh, let me uh, let me show you that uh, in this in this book, you know, referring to the papers that was published, look at the in at the Massachusetts General Hospital patients were in 1958 66 patients with prolonged mechanical ventilation but in in 1971 there were 40 100 or 50 100 patients you increase a lot the use of mechanical ventilation to solve the problem of respiratory failure so one point, really important point for the, for the paradigm is the definition of the problem. A definition of the problem has evolved a lot since then. So you, see, you can see here in this slide that the first, the first uh, definition of respiratory failure and the, and the respiratory failure in the adult ARDS was first described in 1967 in, the, in, the, in Lancet, but then, uh, you know, the societies uh, make a report of the American-European Consensus Conference in 1994, and just a few years, you know, two years ago, we, we know we have the acute respiratory distress syndrome, the Berlin definition, published in JAMA in 2012. So, and now we have this definition, which is that definition that we have today uh, could be better or worse, but is that definition that we have today uh, of the respiratory failure. The timing is an acute, the chest images are bilateral infiltrates, the origin uh, the origin of edema is not uh, only uh, is not uh, uh, is mainly from respiratory origin and the oxygenation. We we have the mild, moderate, and severe respiratory distress related to the PF ratio of the patients. So this is important. A good definition, at least the definition that we have today. But what about the treatment in those days, in the early days? The treatment was. You know, the respiratory failure, the definition that we had, the mechanical ventilation was always two types of mechanical ventilation, was always invasive and controlled, but with two different types, pressure or volume control. And the ventilator that we used was the ventilator available. You know that uh, I, I was, you know, re referring to the Engstrom ventilator that you can see in the left side. And in the right side was the mother image of the new Engstrom ventilator. So the same machine, a little better, but the, that was the ventilator that we had in the 70s. It was the volume ventilator, volume control ventilator. We had then also uh, another ventilator, which was the bird ventila ventilator. It was an assist control pressure cycle ventilation, ventilator. And you can see here the Dr. Forrest Bird, you know, with the, with, uh, uh, with the President Bush, you know, receiving uh, you know, a medal uh, of the Congress. But also, the, uh, Forrest Bird was with me, this is me, you know, in the, with uh, Dr. Bird, one year before the medal was given. And uh, we were talking uh, in our course here in Valencia, and we were together, you know, because he was an inventor, not exactly an anesthesiologist. An inventor, he, he, he loved to, uh, a lot, you know, to invent devices like this one. But uh, I would like to stress that this, uh, the, uh, I mean, the bird ventilator was the first ventilator, you know, in, uh, with uh, trigger sensitivity. You, you could adjust the sensitivity of the trigger because this was an assist 
control ventilator and the, and, uh, and the, the ventilation was assisted and you could uh, you know, change the sensitivity of the trigger. Two or three more uh, you know, milestones in the treatment of the respiratory distress. You know, for example, this one in which the, the uh, you know, the PEEP was defined, the adult respiratory distress syndrome, you know, principle of management. You know, the, in, 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 in this paper, you know, the PEEP was the defined and, the, and was a very big uh, step to uh, improve the treatment of these patients. Also, this other one in which uh, we started to apply this positive pressure continuously in the airway without tracheal intubation and was the, the you know the CPAP system starting to be applied for the respiratory failure patient and starting to improve the prognosis. So uh, first and really important you know that respiratory failure we have a definition mechanical ventilation then was invasive pressure or volume, and the ventilator was available. To have a ventilator available is really important. You know, it, it, maybe you don't uh, you realize how important it is, but uh, if you look some pu to the publications from uh, today, like this one, need for ventilators in the developing world, an opportunity to improve care and save lives. So you have to you have to realize, and I would like to point out, that the, maybe today, in the similar to Copenhagen in 1953, in the present day, the provision of ventilators to developing countries has the unique potential to reduce mortality, uh, one of the world's most vulnerable patients. So it's important to realize that maybe we live in a, in a you know, not uh, already a developed country, but there is still place for uh, any ventilator to be applied in a developing countries to reduce mortality a lot of, of the patients uh, suffering from respiratory failure. For example, this is a paper, you know, that uh, review the Thailand mechanical ventilators in the study. And you see here that in Thailand there is only 2,000 mechanical ventilators. And you can imagine that maybe there is not enough ventilators for everyone. But even in our days, in our countries, I would like to show you that even today, you know, when we had the pandemic influenza, uh, uh, you know, two years ago, you know, we, we had to choose the patients to have ventilators available even in always, the, I mean, already developed countries. So this is a paper from the, from the Australian people, you know, telling that uh, the criteria to supplement critical care for the allocation of ventilators during a pandemic influenza. So it's important to realize that even if you have ventilators to treat patients with uh, respiratory failure, maybe these ventilators in a case of a, a, a pandemia maybe are not enough and you need protocols to improve the triage of, the, of these patients and to apply the best ventilation, the best ventilator. So let's move ahead and just to, I would like to show you a nice paper from, uh, from uh, Bob Kakmarek, a nice uh, man, you know, from uh, Boston, and showing the, uh, uh, the mechanical ventilation, what's the past, the present, and the future. So in this very nice paper from Bob Kakmarek, you know, it's uh, stating what was the evolution of the mechanical ventilation uh, in the past days and for the future. And you say that uh, first, early 90s, second, third, fourth, that we are now, late 90s to present, is plethora of ventilation modes. So what we have today or up to date is a plethora of ventilator modes. And it's really difficult to, to select the mode of the patient because as you can see here in this paper from Bob Chadbourne in, uh, in, in respiratory care, there is a complex possibilities of classification or taxonomy of the modes of ventilation, defining the breath first, second, defining an assisted breath, three, specifying the means of assisted breath, four, classifying breath. So there is a complex, and look at the tenth, constructing a formal taxonomy for modes of ventilation 
composed of control variables, B sequences, and targeting scale. It's, uh, it's nice to see this because even, but you have to realize that uh, even a, a single mode can perform differently in different ventilators. So we, we at the same mode is not exactly the same mode depending on the ventilator. I would like to put you a very easy example. So look at this. This is me, and this is a very well-known, famous, you know, a screen star. So we are, we, we are both men, you know, and, and maybe artists too, because I'm an artist of anesthesia, and this, I'm, 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 this Mr. Pitt is, uh, is an artist in the, in the screen. But uh, we are not the same. So we are not equivalent. So and, the, and when you have two things, the two things, one is always better than the second. So this is the base of what we call evidence-based medicine. So we need to check what are the difference between two similar things, but these things are similar but not equal. So you need to perform control trials to see that two things that look similar are not similar and one is better than the other. So this is really important. And the same happens with the ventilators. So we have the same modes in a lot of ventilators. There are different ventilators. You can see here uh, the, uh, you know, several of uh, those ventilators that we have in, uh, in, uh, in the common practice. And uh, what happens is that, uh, unfortunately, not all ventilators perform the same way, even in the same mode. So the point is that having the same definition of respiratory failure, knowing that we need mechanical ventilation, when you go to ventilators, even the same mode of ventilation do not perform the same way with the different ventilators. So, for example, let's look at a very basic thing, which is the delivering of tidal volume. Tidal volume delivery in ICU ventilators in this bench study published in respiratory care very, very recently. And you can see here that the conclusion, you, you see that this, uh, in, in this, the first line is the uh, tidal volume is setting at 300, the second 400, the third 500, uh, etc. And you see that in the, and you know, in the, in the Y axis, you have the percent error. So you can see that there is a different errors in different ventilators, setting 300, 400, etc. milliliters. So the conclusion of this paper is that in BTPS, in body temperature pressure, I mean, uh, status, the condition, the volume error differs substantially across ICU ventilator for tidal volume delivery, which is a basic thing when you set in your own ventilation 400. You have to know exactly what is the error that your ventilator has. As you can see, the error are di really different for the area, the Engstrom care station, Evita, Evita, XL, Purits, and Bennett, etc. So we need to know what is the, the possibilities of this ventilator, and you have to know what is the mode that you use and the exactitude of the, all the, the settings that you have in this, in this, in this uh, ventilator. But not only for control ventilation, but also for assist ventilation. So there are you know, very, a lot of papers telling that the assist and supported breaths they are, I mean, must interact with the patient demands, must interact. So no, it's a must that the ventilator must follow the patient because a synchrony with patient and ventilator promote muscle overload and fatigue, discomfort, and increase the sedation needs, which, uh, which, uh, which is really bad, you know, and uh, you know you have to, your patient more days on ventilator or, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the prognostic is not, uh, is, uh, is, uh, Less, less good, you know. Let's see now in the new generation of, uh, of the turbine in the in a ventilator. You know, now we have applied the, uh, the, 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 the turbines that we have in our planes 
to our ventilator. So uh, now we have uh, several modes of turbines which are inserted in the mechanical ventilators. These uh, turbines uh, they have been analyzed in a, a lot of papers. Look at this one. This is a, a bench study of intensive care unit ventilators comparing new ventilators versus old ventilators and also turbine ventilation versus compressed gas-based ventilator. So, and, and you can see here how is the measure to evaluate this, uh, this ventilator. This is a, in the left side uh, e uh, image, uh, in the, you know, the red line is when you start to breathe, the pressure is negative, and then when the ventilator start to support the breath, there is going back to zero and then starting a positive pressure indicating that the, the ventilator is supporting you. So we have uh, an, uh, here at the, in the right side of the, of, the, of the graphic, we have again these two areas in gray, which are the surface of these areas are proportional to the effort because is the pressure delivered, the pressure exerted during the time of inspiration. So we have two main factors, what we call inspiratory delay time, which is from the onset of the inspiratory effort to the onset of positive pressure, okay, to, this is the delay time, you know, the delay of the, of the ventilator to support the patient. And, we call the, and what we call the pressure time product, which is uh, an image of the effort of the patient, which is related to the area, the gray area inside the pressure related to the time. So the pressure time product is the, this gray area. On this, in this uh, paper, the several ventilators were compared, and you can see here the results. This, uh, the upper part of the graph is the inspiratory uh, time delay and the lower part is the pressure time product. And you can see that there is a very different, you know, uh, values for the different ventilators. Look at, uh, if, if we put, you know, a line, for example, at 100 milliseconds, you can see here, for example, the Savina is below 100 milliseconds, but the pressure time product is higher than other ventilators. So when you look at the one, uh, ventilator, maybe this is very good in the response time, but this is not that good for the relieving the effort of the patient. So as you can see, the, the behavior of the, of the ventilators, the performance is completely different, in, not only in, in the inspiratory delay time, but also in supporting the effort of the patient. So what's nice to see as a conclusion of this paper that uh, uh, the technical performance vary considerably across new generation ICU ventilators. So they are not the same, you know, even knowing that they were analyzed in pressure support. So the pressure support was the same in every ventilator, but the, the, the behavior of the pressure support, the, the, I mean, the characteristic of the pressure support in, time, in terms of delay time and pressure time product was completely different. And this is an image looking at the, the I mean, the turbine is uh, the white uh, bar and the, and the compressed gas uh, ventilator is the black bar. You can see the trigger de delay is always better because it's lower for the turbine but when you go to the effort, you know, the compressed gas ventilators you know, su supply a better uh, response for the effort, reduce the effort more than the turbine in the analyzed ventilators. So uh, for, uh, for, yeah, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to, to show you some results that we have uh, performed in our own laboratory and uh, only with turbine ventilators. We, we, this is our lab laboratory. You can see the test lung, you know, in the close to the uh, uh, left side and, and also the, the machine, I mean, the lab computer to record all the traces from the ventilator and two ventilators that are tested in that moment. So this is the, uh, the setup of the, 
of the experiments, of the bench experiments, and uh, let's uh, show some results. For example, this preliminary result that will be published, you know, uh, in the next uh, next year. Look, we, we use a normal obstructive, restrictive, and mixed pattern. So it's like uh, you ventilate the patient, a normal patient, an obstructive, restrictive, or obstructive plus restrictive patients. And we analyze at first the tidal volume accuracy. And you can see that even the V60 from uh, Philips, the Trilogy from Philips, you know, the, the accuracy of the tidal volume was quite good, you know, in the, in, during the ventilation of all the, and different from the Carina, which else was also quite good, you know, but completely different. I would like to stress that you have to measure and to know what are the results to choose one ventilator or another when you are using these ventilators at the bedside. So if you compare in trigger delay, trigger delay, the V60 or the trilogy in the active circuit with the Corina, you can see that the, 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 the trigger delay time is different in the, in, even in the, with the same ventilator when the patient change the condition. So you look at the V60, 141 milliseconds to 178. So it's different. Quite quite the same for obstructiva or restrictive, but quite different, you know, in when you use in different patients. So uh, you don't have to think in terms of that um, a mode of ventilation or a ventilator perform the same way with any, you know, because of the mode or because of the patient. No, they perform completely different. And uh, in fact, at the bedside, you have to choose, you know, the best, uh, not only the best mode, but also the best, uh, I mean, the best, uh, ventilator and the best uh, characteristics of the ventilation to, to use in the patient. There are, these are, you know, graphs of, uh, of these results. Here, look at the first graph. The first, the blue line is the rising the flow, I'm sorry, rising the pressure. And the second, the red one is rising the flow simultaneously in the a, in a, in a, in a same patient. This is, uh, you know, below the two uh, traces of the same of all, a different ventilator, and in the right also a different ventilator, and it's really easy to to see how the 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 ramp of the pressure is completely different or quite different when you compare one ventilator to another. So when you decide to use a ramp or to use a ventilator, the ramp are really different, and the patient are comfortable or not depending on this flow or this pressure ramp. So you have to adjust not only the value of the ramp, but also to know exactly what is the possible ramp, possible of uh, ramp possibilities of ramp in your ventilator. So uh, uh, this is uh, I would like to show you uh, uh, the uh, last study uh, with uh, published already in respiratory care. You know, uh, looking at the leak compensation, leak compensation when you use acute care ventilator during non-invasive non -invasive and invasive ventilation. It's also a bench study published by Robert Katmarek, uh, and they, they use different leaks, you know, leaks at three to four liters, then another leak of nine to 10, and another big leak from 26 to 27 liters per minute. So three conditions of leaks of the patients to see how they perform during non-invasive and invasive ventilation. Look at this, that uh, there are several ventilators analyzers, Servo I, Perth and Bennett, C5, G5. So, and it's interesting to see the results in terms of synchronization. So, as you, uh, as you can he see here, you know, there is a, uh, in, in non-invasive mode, there is a, incidence, high incidence of auto-triggering or mistriggering when you change the leak. You know, there is this, uh, these uh, uh, bars are indicating the incidence of non-triggering efforts and auto-triggering, you know, changing the leaks in the conditions you see in the, in the, in the horizontal axis, you know, changing the leaks from the first to the third to the second to the third to the third to the one. So different combinations that anyway, there is a, a non-invasive ventilation, you know, a high incidence of asynchrony uh, when you use uh, these ventilators with leaks. 
And I would like also to show you, and this uh, uh, compelling non-invasive in the upper part of the graph to invasive, uh, uh, invasive mode in the lower part of the, of the graph, you see that there is a completely different uh, behavior when you change not only ventilator, but when you change the mother, the, the leak. You know, look at, I mean, let, let's see, uh, you know, the central part, there is a ventilator which, uh, you know, the, in, in non-invasive mode, the, the cycling delay is short when there is small leak, but it's very high when it's high leak. And the, it's completely different when you use the invasive mode with the, you know, the cycling delay is quite good in any circumstances of leak. But if you look at, for example, the servo eye in invasive mode, there is no, no possibility to, to, to cycle when you use in, 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 uh, in invasive mode. There is, a, there is a lack of bars here indicating that you cannot, be, you cannot have uh, the cycling with this ventilator. So, uh, the, I mean, the ventilators maybe are synchronized at baseline, at baseline leak, but and some synchronized a low level leak. But there is a wide variation of ventilator performance when the, the leaks are changed. You know, and you move from low leak to high leak, or there is a changing of leaks in a, in a, when you use it in a, in a patient. So and the conclusion was that the Puritan Venet and the B60 were the only ventilators to synchronize with simulated respiratory effort in all leaks scenarios, and both with invasive and non-invasive ventilation. So, but still, uh, the message of the paper is that ventilator performance is strongly influenced by leak, lung mechanics, and PIP. So, being important, the classification of modes of ventilation is much more important, you know, is the, the, the behavior of the ventilators with a clinical scenario or, you know, a specific clinical scenario. So. In fact, when you look at the, in the same paper that I showed you before with uh, Bob Kakmarek uh, uh, talking about the past, present, and future of the ventilators, and you, if you look at the table to the features of the ventilator of the future, so there is a clearly clear statement telling that uh, one of the future for the ventilator is uh, the ability to effectively ventilate all patients in all settings, invasively or non-invasively. So I would like to stress this because it's really interesting for the comfort of the patient and the comfort of the doctor to have a good ventilator that may, be apply, that may, uh, that may apply, that may be used in a different circumstances of the patients with different characteristics and also with uh, with different uh, I mean with different uh, types of uh, modes of ventilation and different leaks. So I would like to conclude and uh, not to be late today. So my conclusion is that uh, look at that the paradigms are not resolved permanently. So in, in the in the in the in the age in the last century they know it was resolved using tracheostomy or using pressure ventilator or using positive pressure ventilators or starting with CPAP. So, but it's not the same how you manage the the situation in uh, you know depending of the age. So the problems and solutions evolve at different speeds. That's uh, clearly you know we evolved quite fast with the definition of ARDS, but the solution was not that clear you know at that age. So and solutions is really important. This you know solutions may seem identical, but they are not. So uh, it's not only to say. You, respiratory failure, mechanical ventilation and ventilator. This is okay. This is, uh, you know, this is how to resolve the paradigm. But how we solve today? Today is the solution for today of this paradigm that we need a real, real accurate diagnosis of acute respiratory failure. You have to make this accurate diagnosis because it's the first, like, the first line of the treatment. Second, apply maybe escalation 
of the escalation approach. So why not to start with non-invasive ventilation with one ventilator, change to invasive ventilation, and then when you can, if you, you, why not to extubate the patients you know, early and apply again non-invasive ventilation to reduce the invasiveness of the procedure. So it's really important to, to, to know that maybe this, the, this escalation, the escalation approach could be really important for your patient. But, and, and last but not the least, you know, use the best available ventilator. It's not the same, the ventilators that you have at your hand in the, in the, at the bedside. So you have to choose always the best available ventilator. If you don't have much, if you just have one ventilator, apply that one. But you, have, you can choose between two among three, four, five type of mechanical ventilator. Use the best one and use the most suitable for the patient, for the situation. And, uh, well, uh, no, nothing else. I, this is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. These are the Beatles. The Beatles is a musical group, you know, from my age. You know, I love them a lot, and I would like to sometimes to play guitar with, you know, the songs of the Beatles, and I uh, hope you like, you like that. Thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin our question and answer session. If you have a question for our speaker, you have the opportunity to ask your question via the text box in your webcast window. One moment, please, for the first question. Okay, thank you very much for being there. You know, I have uh, now waiting for some question. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there is a uh, Estelle Gones uh, is uh, telling that thanks for the presentation. Is uh, is from South Africa. And uh, it's, my, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. It's been my pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much for staying there. Okay. Okay. So uh, I have a, a nice question from uh, from here uh, that uh, asking me how long was the bench study that we conducted. So. It's a, it's a nice question because uh, sometimes it takes a lot of time to conduct a study. And uh, I have to tell that uh, it, it took us more than uh, one month, you know, working not every day, but almost every day in the afternoon, you know, staying after our uh, clinical, uh, clinical anesthesia, uh, normal day. And uh, we studied uh, uh, all the turbine ventilators. I have shown only the results of, the, of three of them, but we studied uh, all of turbine ventilators because I think it's really important, and we will publish it, and uh, it's really important to know exactly uh, to know how, uh, what is the performance of the, of the turbines, because I think that clearly, you know, n not all turbines perform the same way. So, and it's really important because I mean, the people claim about no, no, this is a very nice, uh, uh, this is a very nice ventilator because this is a turbine. Okay, I agree. You know, turbine can perform very well, but not all turbines perform very well. So you have to ask, you know all the details to see what are the performance of, uh, of your turbine ventilators. So it took a lot of time to make this type of bench studies and then to, to, you know, to show what are the more relevant results. And, uh, and uh, uh, so um, it's, uh, sometimes it's important to know exactly the, how the results are. Thank you. So 
So uh, there is here another question that telling me that asking me if it is important to have a device that works invasive and non-invasive. So it's more important for doctors or for nurses. Okay, well when you you are uh, working uh, at, at the bedside, you you realize uh, you know really uh, clearly you know and, and you know that. Uh, a ventilator is important to be invasive and non-invasive because you don't have to change the ventilator from one treatment to the other. So it's really important and also because you know exactly what the ventilator is and what the ventilator, a ventilator performs. So if you, if you don't change the ventilator, it's really easy to change from one ventilation to another because you don't have to change the machine. And also you know exactly what is the performance of that ventilator. So it's really interesting from my point of view, it's really easy and you save time and you save effort and you save a lot of things if you, if you have a ventilator that can be used in both situations as, as was seen in the, in, the, uh, in, in, in the paper from Bob Kakmarek you know, I can go back to this, uh, that is uh, the ability to effectively ventilate all patients in all settings, invasive and non-invasively, will be one of the features of the, of the future. And this is uh, very important, is uh, maybe some, uh, is more important for, is, is important for doctors, but also for nurses, because nurse is the first line of the treatment, uh, you know, of, for, for the patient, and the nurses stay, you know, at the bedside during all the day, all the, you know, the duty cycle, you know, and uh, they work there very hardly, and uh, and they have to 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 change the ventilator and to change the mode and to think in different terms when they change the ventilator is really tough. So it's uh, the, it's uh, very good for us. I think it's much uh, it's a very important issue for for the uh, nurses and respiratory therapists. Thank you very much for the for the uh, for this uh, for this um, for the question. Let, uh, uh, let this is a this is a, a new question here. That uh, uh, were you able to compare piston-driven ventilators? Uh, uh, yes, but I think that uh, today there is a, a several papers, you know, showing the different. Uh, uh, the different uh, uh, behavior of the of the ventilators, the, the driven and the piston driven. But in, but uh, anyway, we have to make another uh, study, another you know, using the new piston driven ventilators. So uh, that will be a nice uh, nice uh, task for us uh, as well. And uh, we are going to we are going to work in that uh, in that time. I, we will publish as soon as we have. Okay, let's uh, let's see more questions. Okay, I think that uh, I think uh, there is no no question. Let's wait a moment. I I will put you the Beatles slide again. <laughs> okay. Let's see if there is a. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that uh, we can, if you don't have uh, any more questions, that we can finalize right now. And please don't hesitate to contact me by email, to ask me uh, in the presentation or whatever you want, or more detailed information about all the results I have shown, uh, you know, uh, bibliography or whatever you want, or even visiting us, you know, in our institution. You will be, all these things will be welcomed, and I will thank you again for being there for, and share this time with me. Thank you very much, and, uh, and just uh, thank you. Okay.